let's look at the beginning, just, just the beginning of chapter 3 of the Reconstruction of Religious Law in Islam, the conception of God and the meaning of prayer. Iqbal says, We have seen that the judgment based upon religious experience fully satisfies the intellectual test. This transitional remark uh, explains what's going on um, uh, in the, the structure of the whole text. Chapter 1 uh, introduced the idea of the intellectual test. Chapter 2 applied the intellectual test. Now, uh, at the end of chapter 2, he said philosophy must give way to prayer. Now, we're resuming that line of thought. And uh, remarking further on the intellectual test, saying, The more important regions of experience, examined with an eye on a synthetic view, reveal as the ultimate ground of all experience a rationally directed, creative will, which we have found reasons to describe as an ego. Ego is uh, an old Latin word for I. It's usually mean, it usually uh, refers to a mind or a self. In order to emphasize the individuality of the ultimate ego, the Quran gives him the proper name of Allah and further defines him as follows. Quoting from the Quran, Say, Allah is one, all things depend on him. He begetteth not, and he is not begotten, and there is none like unto him. But it is hard to understand what exactly is an individual. All right, so before we continue on individuality of God, okay, um... The intellectual test works. Religion is thus far vindicated, but philosophy uh, that reveals by s philosophy um, that recognizes that experience reveals that ultimate reality is mind or uh, is uh, well described by the word ego. This philosophy must give way to prayer. So now we have to talk about God with a view towards uh, well understanding something about prayer. And we reference the Quran as teaching that God is one, and God does not beget, and God is not begotten. Now here we have this interesting, and I would say terribly complicated, uh, set of connections, comparisons, and contrasts to consider. We have a Christian theology, we have the Quran, we have Iqbal's commentary on these matters, and we have this French philosopher, Bergson. And uh, Iqbal is talking about all of these things. Uh, Bergson, he says, as Bergson has taught us in his Creative Evolution, Creative Evolution is a book by this French philosopher, Henry Bergson, or Henri Bergson, individuality is a matter of degrees and is not fully realized even in the case of apparently closed off unity of the human being. And then Iqbal quotes Bergson. And Bergson says that, um, let's see if I can paraphrase this. Bergson says that biological reproduction is, I guess I'll just quote him here, what is reproduction but the building up of a new organism with a detached fragment of the old? Reproduction involves making a new organism out of a detached piece of the old organism. That's what reproduction is. And so biologically speaking, uh, Perfect individuality, at least uh, in biological organisms, isn't quite possible. We have built into us uh, a tendency to reproduce, which means we have a tendency to have limitations to our unity. We have a tendency to have pieces of us that break off to become new organisms. Iqbal says now, in the light of this passage, it is clear that the perfect individual closed off as an ego, peerless and unique, uh, cannot be conceived as harboring its own enemy at home. Well, there I'd better rewind that to uh, Bergson. Bergson says, individuality therefore harbors its own enemy at home, by which I believe he means an individual organism, biologically speaking, has within itself a tendency to reproduce, and therefore a tendency to have pieces of it break off to make new organisms, and therefore has an, in, an enemy of its own individuality uh, built in. We have built into us that reproductive tendency which is in itself an enemy of our own individuality to the, to the extent that reproduction involves breaking off a piece of us to make a new organism. So um, Iqbal says it is clear Bergson is correct about this analysis, and it is clear, therefore, that the perfect individual closed off as an ego, peerless and unique, cannot be conceived in this way. God cannot be thought of in this way. God cannot be thought of as having the tendency to break a piece of himself off uh, to reproduce. So God cannot beget or be begotten. Beget means to, to reproduce uh, in this fashion. 
it must be conceived that it's a god, or the, the perfect individual, closed off as an ego, must be conceived as superior to the antagonistic tendency of reproduction. This characteristic of the perfect ego is one of the most essential elements in the Quranic conception of God, and the Quran mentions it over and over again, not so much with a view to attack the current Christian conception as to accentuate its own view of a perfect individual. So, uh, now he's mentioned Christian theology. So, uh, the Quran, of course, says God does not begin. And this appears to be some sort of criticism or refutation of or disagreement with Christian theology, because Christian theology talks about uh, God the Son being begotten. Now, um, as what we're doing here is a desperate attempt to uh, bring order to a dizzying array of cross-references and interpretations, let's add another one. I'm Christian. It is December 1. It is the 1st of December as I'm recording this video. And... I don't know or care if this is fashionable, but I'm wearing this green shirt with this red tie, which also happens to be my Christmas tie. So, you know, Merry Christmas, everyone. And know this about Christian theology. In Christian theology, Jesus, Isa, Yesu, Yeshu, Yeshua, is born from the Virgin Mary. Note that key word there, the Virgin Mary. I suppose technically the birth is not particularly miraculous, but the conception is. And Jesus is not begotten, biologically speaking, nothing of the sort. When we talk about, uh, when Christians talk about God the Son being begotten of God the Father, we absolutely do not mean anything biological. No, that, that's a heresy. God forbid anyone say that. That, uh, that's not right. C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, for another cross-reference and intertextual commentary, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity describes the idea very nicely. He says that um, uh, you can make a thing that is sort of like you, but if you're, if you're just making it, then it's not exactly like you. To make is to make a thing that may resemble you, but to beget is to make something of the same kind as you. So a person painted this picture of Iqbal. Neither the person nor Iqbal himself in this case, begot anything, because this picture is not like Iqbal or like the painter. I mean, it's like them in some respects. It resembles them. It has a nose. Iqbal had a nose. The person who made this picture had a nose. But this picture is not the same kind of thing as Iqbal the man or the person who painted this picture. When you beget something, you make something of the same kind. A man paints a picture. A man begets a child. Uh, that's, uh, that's how Lewis describes it. And he says, uh, God the Son, Jesus, is begotten of God the Father because uh, it's the making of a being of the same kind. Not a different God, but a being who is actually the same God. Christianity is unambiguously committed to monotheism. Uh, saying God and Jesus are two separate gods is, again, heresy, God forbid we say that. So the idea is not that there is, um, not that God begets biologically, or that any piece of God breaks off to reproduce himself, or anything like that, that's somewhere between misunderstanding and heresy. The idea is uh, not that there's two gods. The idea is that there's some eternal distinction in the one God. There's one, one, one God, only one God. There is one God. This is pretty unambiguous in the Bible. There's only one God, and this God has within him certain distinctions, which we describe as persons. And I like to liken this to other things uh, in, we know from experience, where, where substance and personhood do not always have a one-to-one -one correspondence. It's not the case that every time you have one substance, there's one person and vice versa. Uh, think again of that reproduction thing uh, that Bergson and Ibal were just talking about here. In human reproduction, we find that physical substance overlaps a little bit. Let's not get too graphic. Uh, with respect to uh, either conception or pregnancy. But um, there is some overlapping, some sharing of physical space and of physical substance in the process of human reproduction. Now, I, I don't think this uh, in itself is a perfect illustration of anything, but it does help to, to illustrate this one principle. It's a principle I think of as a metaphysical principle, a principle for how we should understand reality. The principle is thinghood or personhood or substance does not always correspond to person in a simple, straightforward, direct, one-to-one -one correspondence. It's not the case that every time you have one thing, you have one person, and it's not the case that every time you have one person, you have one thing. Christian theology just says that there is one God, one God, one God, one thing that is God, only one. And that thing that is God, that one thing that is God, 
involves three persons. We call them God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And a traditional Christian description of the relationship of God the Father and God the Son is that God the Son is begotten of God the Father, which just means that God the Son is made as the same kind of thing, which in this case has to mean the same God. A distinct person, but the same God as God the Father. So, I might also pause to say that um, probably this language of begetting, while it's very, very well established in, in, in Christian thought, Christian history, Christian theology, Christian philosophy, uh, I'm not entirely sure if I could point to any particular passage in the scripture that says it. Uh, John 3.16 uh, has a particular Greek word, monogenes, which probably does not mean only begotten Son of God so much as only unique Son of God. Um, uh, God so loved the world, for in this way God loved the world that he gave his only unique Son, monogenes, his only unique Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All right, so what have we accomplished as I go off on all these tangents? Well, let's see if we can tie them, tie them together. Christian theology talks about God the Son being begotten and, uh, of God the Father. And that means, in the traditional understanding, as uh, elaborated by C.S. Lewis, Josan, it means making something the same kind, which in this case necessarily means not making a different God. And it certainly does not mean anything biological, and it does certainly not mean anything like God breaking a piece of himself off to make another, another God. Another person, no, no, God forbid, all that's heresy. Another person, yes, but not breaking a piece of yourself off to make another person, no. God the Father, if I may be permitted to use this language, makes God the Son, who is the same kind of being, and indeed, therefore, the same being, since that's the kind of being God is, one unique being, God makes the same kind of being uh, as himself, which means two persons in one God. Well, I've uh, failed to summarize. That was more of a uh, semi-detailed reiteration. So now let's try again to summarize. Christian theology talks about uh, God the Father begetting God the Son. And this does not mean anything biological. It does not mean breaking off a piece of God to make something else that's God. It does not mean two gods. It does not mean anything biological. It does not mean anything that involves breaking a piece off of God. Uh, which means, by false terms, actually, Christian theology... Paul's term drawing from Bergson. Christian theology is totally okay. And interestingly, what does Paul say? He says... The Quran mentions this idea that God does not beget over and over again, not so much with a view to attack the current Christian conception as to accentuate its own view of a perfect individual. Which means, if we're going to get back to Iqbal and stop my Christian theology lesson, the whole point of this is we're not even talking about Christian theology here at all. We're just emphasizing God is, by definition, a unique individual. Unlike us. God has individuality more than we do. All right, with that, I think we can move on just a bit. Let's skip over his discussion of light, interesting as it is. Let's um, well, let's try one sentence summary of all we've done, uh, setting aside the commentary on Bergson on Christian theology, Iqbal's commentary on the Quran as not primarily, uh, maybe not at all, maybe not primarily, I'm not sure. He just says not so much with a view to attack the current Christian conception as to accentuate its own view of a perfect individual. Let's attempt a summary now, setting aside uh, all the detailed meanderings through uh, Christian theology, Paul's commentary on the Quran with respect to Christian theology, or rather not even talking about it, and Bergson. Setting all the details aside, what's the point? The point is God is one Individual, full stop, and the word individual needs to be in italic. God is one individual. God is one thing. God is one peerless and unique being. Now, let's skip over how much? Oh, let's skip over one-third of a very long paragraph. All oh, that was still in one paragraph for me. Bob. <laughs> Let's go to the next paragraph or two, and we're not going to read all of them. Does not individuality imply finitude? So we think of God as infinite. But if God is an ego, and as such an individual, how can we conceive him as infinite? The answer to this question is that God cannot be conceived as infinite in the sense of spatial infinity. So you're totally okay to think of God as infinite and as individual. But don't think of 
individuality is implying finitude. At least, not the wrong kind of finitude. God is certainly not infinite in terms of spatial infinity. Now, you're not supposed to think of God uh, in terms of space. That's the wrong way to think of God. God's not made of matter. God doesn't occupy space. You can't think of God as an, a thing that occupies an infinite amount of space. No, no, you're thinking of God in materialistic terms. Stop doing that. Beyond him, uh, I'm skipping a few lines, but beyond him and apart from his creative activity, there's neither time nor space to close him off in reference to other egos. The ultimate ego is therefore neither in the sense of spatial infinity nor finite in the sense of the space-bound human ego whose body closes him off in reference to other egos. Now, how do we think of the infinity of God? The infinity of the ultimate ego consists in the infinite inner possibilities of his creative activity of which the universe as known to us is only a partial expression. How do we think of the infinity of God? Infinite inner possibilities of creative activity. God contains within himself an infinite an unlimited possibility of creative activity. And the universe as we know it is only a partial expression of the infinite creativity of God. In one word, God's infinity is intensive, not extensive. It involves an infinite series, but it is not that series. The other important elements in the Quranic conception of God from a purely intellectual point of view are creativeness, knowledge, omnipotence, and eternity. I shall deal with them serially or in order. So now we have a list of the uh, characteristics of God as understood Quranically. Infinity, understood as uh, this uh, unlimited creativity, followed by creativeness, knowledge, omnipotence, and eternity. And Iqbal is going to talk about those. And then somewhere in this chapter, he's sure to say something about what this teaches us about prayer. And remember, this is how uh, we move past mere philosophizing about God and do something better. Philosophy must give way to prayer, as he says at the end of chapter 2. And I'm done for this video. We will, I expect, talk about God's creativeness, or at least about what Iqbal says about God's creativeness, uh, knowledge, omnipotence, and eternity, and what that tells us about prayer in future videos. See you then. Thanks for watching. Finally, a brief addendum on Christian theology, on which I think I spoke somewhat too hastily earlier in this video. I think I had the right ideas in my head, but I should have had more of the language of Lewis, not just the ideas I was using uh, under some influence of Lewis. Now the contrast, uh, the contrast, well that's the ideas I had right. The contrast is between begetting and creating. In Christian theology we can say, we should say, we must say that God creates everything, everything except God. We must not say that God creates God. God is uncreated. We cannot say that God creates God. We cannot say that God the Father creates God the Holy Spirit or that God the Son creates God the Holy Spirit. We cannot say that God the Son is created by God the Father. We must say uh, that there's one God and three persons who are God. That is, uh, that's the, the actual theology, the doctrine of the Trinity. One God, three persons who are God, but one God. And there is some eternal distinction between these different persons who are God. There's some, some eternal distinction in the essence of God that we can understand as uh, three persons. And we can name them God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's put them in the proper order. We could name them God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We can, to some extent, describe the relationships among them, but we may not say that any of them is created by any other. We can say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, uh, and most of us add, and the Son. God the Holy Spirit proceeds from God the Father and from God the Son. And we can say that God the Son is begotten of God the Father, but we may not say that God the Son is created by God the Father. No. So far, so good. This is what I was trying to describe earlier in the video. I think I got that right. What I did wrong was I used the word make in this versatile sense. I say, if I may be permitted to use the word make in this sense, um, to beget is to make something of the same kind. Well, I can't promise you that you won't find some very versatile sense of the word make in an English dictionary that will work for that, and that's all I was going for, for the record. But also for the record, uh, I was not speaking properly. I shouldn't use the word make in that sense at all. If there is a versatile English word that can be used for both sides of the contrast, I don't know what it is, and I don't think it's make. What we may say is that God the Father begets God the Son, and what we may say is that God creates everything that is not God, and we can also say that God makes everything that is not God, but we should not say that God the Father makes God the Son. To beget is to beget something of the same kind, but it's dangerous to use the word make to paraphrase that contrast. And the reason is fairly simple. It's just that the word make needs to go with the word create. The words are 
too synonymous for us to use the word make in the versatile way in which I was trying to use that word make. Uh, let's, let's look at the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed, one of the oldest, uh, greatest statements of Christian theology, unambiguously takes the word make and puts it on the create side of that distinction. The Nicene Creed says, incidentally, I think this is rooted in the Greek word poiao, but uh, in the English, the Nicene Creed says, God the Son is begotten of God the Father, begotten, not made. 